Good morning, everybody. Good to be with you today. Uh, good to be with you if you're in Norfolk or watching online. Uh, okay, here's what I'm going to do today. Number one, I have an announcement for you. Number two, I have a pre-sermon sermon. And number three, I have the regularly re prepared remarks. So a lot, lot going on today. I'm going to start with the announcement. This Wednesday is the beginning of Lent. And we don't always talk a lot about Lent around here. So I wanted to make sure everybody knew what it was. Uh, Lent is the 40 days leading up to Easter. And if you grew up uh, Catholic or Lutheran or, or some other more liturgical tradition, you are familiar with Lent beginning with Ash Wednesday. Um, but this year, as a staff, we're we're doing something special during Lent, and I just thought it would be good to let you know what we're doing and invite you to join us if you would like. During these 40 days, we are going to be using this devotional book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality Day by Day, to guide us in our time with God together. Uh, on the subtext here is a 40-day journey with the Daily Office. Now, I want to make sure you know the Daily Office is not a short YouTube series based on the hit show with Steve Carell. Uh, some of you would be very interested in that. No, the Daily Office is simply a way of referring to pausing for five or ten minutes in the morning and five or ten minutes in the evening to center our hearts and our minds on God. And so, I'd love to invite you to join us. You can buy that book anywhere, find books are sold. Uh, around here, we're going to set our alarms on our phones a couple times during the day and just encourage us to pause and reflect on Jesus to prepare our hearts for Easter. So if that would help you have a growing relationship with Jesus, I'd invite you to join us. Okay, announcement down. Um, second, the pre-sermon sermon. Um, uh, we are going to, in just a moment, take some time to pray for Ukraine. But in addition to praying for Ukraine, I would like to take a couple minutes to help us think about what's happening in Ukraine from a theological perspective. So let's talk about prayer first. What, what do we pray for the people of Ukraine? Well, we pray that God would have mercy on them. We, we pray for those who have been displaced, those who are starving, those who have lost loved ones already in the fighting, those who fear for their lives those who have lost their homes. We pray for God's mercy to intervene in this now war-torn country. We pray for justice. We pray that God would restrain evil. We pray that God would use imperfect governments in the world as his agents to restrain evil in the world. We pray for justice. We, we pray for the refugee crisis that is coming from this situation. We pray, and we should pray that we as a nation would be hospitable to refugees that we would, as a church, as a church in our nation and as the church in our nation, be people who are prepared to welcome the foreigner and the alien. It's the, one of the most common themes throughout the scriptures, the priority on those who have been displaced, the priority on the other. Maybe we will have opportunities to support refugees in other nations surrounding Ukraine. But we pray for compassion. We pray for justice. We pray to be prepared to respond. And we're gonna pray all of those things in just a minute. But how do we think theologically about what's happening in Ukraine? You know, you know what I mean by think theologically? Like th th theologically, um, how do we make sense of how what's happening in the world today fits into God's bigger story? Right, that, that's what we try to do around here. We, we, we all have our way of looking at the world and our goal is to align our thoughts with God's thoughts, our perspective with God's perspective. And so to help us with that, I want to take you back to a diagram that I have uh, shared with you several times before. Um, it's this diagram right here. It describes the story of creation to our current day. And, and I'd like you to, to think about it like this. The, the first box here says designed for good. That's creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God created all things and God created people and he said it is good. And when God created, there was no war, there was no famine, there was no pain, there were no economic catastrophes, no relational brokenness. The world was good in its totality. But then when we think about the story that Jesus tells us, the, the gospel story, the story of the scriptures, in Genesis 3, we were damaged by evil. That at the fall, at the fall when sin entered the world, it was not a small moment between two people. 
It was the rebellion that has damaged every single part of our planet since that time. The reason that there is war in Ukraine today is that the world has been damaged by evil. And the reason that there is brokenness, disappointment, pain, trauma in your life is that the world has been damaged by evil. If you've ever thought to yourself, it just seems like things are a little more hard than they need to be. Shouldn't life be a little bit easier? Yes, it should, but we have been damaged by evil. Now, here's why understanding the whole story is so important. Because if we don't recognize that things have been damaged by evil, we will be surprised when evil rears its ugly head. And we will miss the significance of what Jesus did to enter our fallen world. That's the third box right here. We go one, two, three, that Jesus came and it says restored for better. That Jesus entered the world to bring about a hope in the world. And so you can find peace with God. We can find reconciled relationships one another with one another through Jesus. And then Jesus sends his people to be agents of healing into the world. This is the big story leading ultimately to one day when Jesus sets all things right and we are back up here and goodness will rule again in the new creation. Now, I'd like to share with you just a couple a couple of verses from Romans chapter 8, to, again, to help us set our thinking about what's happening in Ukraine. And I want you to see it through this lens. Sorry, I need to move that just a little. Um, Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Rome, says this. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. So he's describing, he's describing the history of the world. All creation, right? Since we were damaged for evil, all of creation has been groaning. And when he wanted to, to describe the intensity of the groaning in creation, he picked the metaphor that describes groaning better than any other. Childbirth. I've been there. It looks awful. I mean, some of you have done it. God bless you, right? All of you who've done it, childbirth, God bless you. But I've been there. There is groaning in childbirth. And that level of pain and agony and groaning and longing has been the condition of the entire planet since sin entered the world right up until the present day. And when he says the present time, he means the time, like the time we're in. It was 2,000 years ago, it's now, it will continue to the future until the next age comes. Verse 23, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, in other words, we who are followers of Jesus, we who have the Holy Spirit, talking to Christians, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. We groan inwardly. Followers of Jesus do not escape the groaning. We do not escape, escape the longing. We do not escape the pain. But we wait for the redemption of our bodies. We are looking forward to the time because Jesus came that one day there will be a new creation. There will be a resurrection. One day God will set the world right. Verse 23, we'll wrap it up with this. For in this hope, we are saved, the redemption of our bodies. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. You, you get that, right? right? Once it happens, it no longer requires hope. It's reality. But we live in this in-between time where as long as we are on this life, we will be groaning inwardly, placing our hope ultimately in the redemption of our bodies. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And so as we wait patiently for God to set the world right in the new creation, as we wait for the redemption of our bodies, we pray that God would intervene. And in his mercy, he does. And we pray that God would bring justice. And we pray that he will now, and we know that he ultimately will when he sets everything right in the new creation creation. 
But it's so important as followers of Jesus, to be able to put what's happening in our global context, and frankly, even in our own lives, into the broader story of what God is doing and has been doing throughout the history of the world. Because if you think that this life should go the way you want it to, you will be sorely disappointed and wrongly angry at God. But if instead you recognize that despite our rebellion, Jesus came and entered the world, to offer you hope and peace and life now and to set things right in the future, you are able to live with hope in this in-between time. So we pray for God to make a way in Ukraine. And we pray for the church in Ukraine, which is strong. And we pray for justice to come and for evil people to be pushed out. And we place our hope in the final redemption of all things. So I want us to pray now and to continue to pray for the people of Ukraine and for our own lives that we could place our hope in God at work now and our hope ultimately in what he will do in the future. So would you, would you pray with me um, for Ukraine? Heavenly Father, we come in Jesus' name. And we pray that you would meet the practical needs of people in Ukraine right now. People who are cold in the middle of winter. People who lack basic necessities like food and shelter and gas for their cars. Would you intervene? Would you be merciful, God? Would you be giving not only practical assistance, but would you bring new life and strength and peace to people who are looking for hope? God, would you arouse your church with compassion for the coming humanitarian crisis? Would you allow us to respond with mercy to those great, most greatly affected? And we pray, God, as a God of justice, that you would push back wickedness in this world and that you would use imperfect governments to be your agents of justice in this situation. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So this is where we've come uh, so far today. We got Sunday at seven tonight, the rescheduled uh, worship and ministry time. Love to, to see there tonight. We got 40 days a prayer or 40 days, Lent, whatever. Emotionally healthy 40 day, whatever. Lent starts on Wednesday, right? We're gonna keep praying for Ukraine. Oh yeah, and I prepared a sermon, so I'm giving it to you. All right, all right. That was all just the preamble. Okay, so we are starting a new series today called Is This a Sign? And I wanna tell you uh, a little story about an important sign uh, that I saw one time. Um, Ashley and I had only been married a couple of months uh, when our friends began to, or continued to get married. So we got married right after we graduated from college and we were the first of our friends to get married which means that we went to a lot of weddings that first summer. And one of those weddings was up in Chicago. And so we uh, drove from our our house down on 22nd Street, the apartment that we were renting there, uh, and we drove up to D.C., and we spent the night with her brother and uh, her sister-in-law. And that was fun, and we got up early the next morning. It was dark, and we left their apartment to leave D.C. and drive to Chicago. Well, this was 1997, so there there was no Maps app on your phone. A map was something called paper. Uh, And you actually had a map, right? And we had these things called triptychs. Some of you remember triptychs? Anybody? Any, like a few of us? Okay, like 12 of us? Great. So basically, here's the point. If you were lost, you were like all the way lost. I mean, and we got up early. We left their apartment in D.C., and before we knew it, we were lost. We weren't just lost. We were lost in, like, the worst parts of Washington, D.C. Not the pretty parts. We were lost in the worst parts. And my wife, she was not doing well. Let me tell you, there are no tears like new bride tears, right? I mean, if you've been a new bride or married to a new bride, new bride tears are a lot. And she, I mean, she's like, she's like hey, hey, we, let's just go home, right? She's here, like, let's not even go to Chicago. Let's just go home. And what I'm thinking to myself is, sweetheart, We don't even know how to go home. We're lost. I mean, I didn't say that because I was a new husband, but I wasn't that new. But that's what I was thinking. Like, we can't just go home. We don't even know where the interstate is, dear. And And here's the real miracle in the story. I'm the one who said we should stop and ask for directions. 
And she wasn't having it. She was too scared. She's like, we are not stopping. You are not leaving me in this car to get out. She was terrified. Well, eventually, right? I'm like, honey, we got to stop. So stopped, asked for directions. Some nice man said, hey, see that sign? Go down there, take a left, whatever. You'll see a sign for the interstate and then you'll be on your way. It's like, okay. So we did that. Boom, boom, boom. We got on our way, made it to Chicago. Now it's just a funny story. Now, why, why do I tell you that story? Because when we were getting directions to get out of there, to get to the interstate, to get to Chicago, it wasn't the sign that said whatever, 395 or 95, whatever, the, whatever that sign was. It wasn't the sign that was the most important part, right? It was that beyond that sign, the interstate really was that would get us where we needed to go. It wasn't the sign. It was what the sign pointed to that was the most important part. I mean, I know, I know you, you get this. You get this intuitively, but I want to just bring us all on the same page, right? The sign points us to the future reality. The sign for 395 tells you that if you go that extra whatever, you'll get to 395, right? So we see this all the time when driving. So for instance, you know, if you're deciding to go to Richmond and you come to this sign, do I want to go to Norfolk, Virginia Beach or I want to go to Richmond? The point of the sign is not the sign. The point of the sign is if you follow, it'll get you to Richmond. On your way to Richmond, right? You see one of those blue signs on the side of the road. And uh, the blue side on the side of the road Tells you the different restaurants that you could be stopping at, right? You see, there you go. Here's all the different restaurants you could stop at. Now, of course, if you saw this sign, you would think to yourself, why would anyone stop at this exit? There's no Chick-fil-A. I mean, nope, right? I mean, that's, that's the first thing you think, like, nobody, who is, I mean, really, is anybody stopping here? I can't imagine. But anyway, uh, if you wanted McDonald's uh, for some reason, uh, okay, full disclosure, I had two Egg McMuffins this morning, so I actually, I've been really grooving on McDonald's. Um, but uh, yeah, they were really good. Uh, but, so the point isn't the sign, right? The point is that there's actually a McDonald's there. You see the sign, blue sign, red sign for McDonald's. Boom, get the, okay, McDonald's. Now, why don't I tell you all this? Because in the Gospel of John, in the Gospel of John, right? And there, there are four accounts of the life and teaching of Jesus, his, his ministry, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Um, in the Gospel of John, which is the most different of the three, the other three have a lot of similarities. John is very different. Um, pastors and theologians ha have noticed over the centuries that in John's Gospel, he tells seven very specific miracles that Jesus did, but then he refers to these seven miracles as signs. So you know some of these miracles, right? If you've been around or you've heard of Jesus at all, you know, healing a, a person born blind, feeding 5,000 people, raising Lazarus from the dead, all these different kinds of miracles. But then John says these miracles are also a sign. And this is the, the question we want to begin to think about today. What if Jesus' miracles were more than miracles? Right? If it's a miracle, it's just a miracle, but what if they were a sign? In other words, what if they were pointing towards something? What if the point of healing the man born blind wasn't just that a man got his sight back, as great as that is? What if there was something else it was pointing to? What if, what if Jesus was about to do something new? If these miracles are actually signs, they are signs pointing to the fact that Jesus is doing something new. And we want to allow these seven signs in the Gospel of John to point us to what Jesus was doing. But remember, uh, John wrote his Gospel, his accounts of what happened with Jesus after Jesus died and rose again. Right, because after Jesus died and rose again, he was like, oh, that's what he was getting at. And, and he wrote down his experience with Jesus. And so we're gonna be in John chapter two today. Um, I'm just gonna read the story to you because it's, it's, it's a narrative and I want you to feel the, the way the story goes. And then we're gonna see some of what this sign is pointing to. This is John chapter two. We're gonna start at verse one. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. 
okay, so it's a wedding, but in the, in the ancient Near East, a wedding was even a bigger deal than weddings are today. No offense, Ryan Levis get married in five days. Very exciting. Ryan Levis, Norfolk campus pastor. That's right. Love it. Can't wait. It's going to be awesome. Um, but Ryan's wedding is going to be, I don't know, four or five hours on Friday night. The weddings in the, in the um, ancient Near East would be days long celebrations inviting the entire community. So this, this huge party. And then in verse three, we read, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Now, why did Jesus' mother say this to him? Well, two reasons. One, they needed wine for the party. <laughs> and two, for some reason, Jesus' mom thought that he could do something about it. Verse four, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. Now, thank you. You had the predictable response because it's the same way I responded when I read this. Um, when, when we read this in our English Bibles and we read, woman, why do you involve me? Nobody like, talks to their mom like, woman, um, like in our, in our world. But, but, but in the time when Jesus lived, this is not a sassy word. Jesus isn't being disrespectful to his mom. He, he's just acknowledging her. So it, it's not him pushing back. He He's, it's just, um, it's soft. Th think of it as Jesus, Jesus saying, Mom, wh why do you involve me? My, my time has not yet come. Now, the reason Jesus says my time has not yet come is that throughout John's gospel, that's how Jesus refers to his death on the cross. So Jesus knew that it wasn't yet time for the world to see his death and then resurrection. So why, why are you involving me now, Mom? It's not yet my time. But like any good son, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you, because she could tell that Jesus was going to help. Now, this is important. I want you to see this in verse six. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Now, I've read this story, I don't know how many times, and I tend to just, you know, just sort of rush by the, the, you know, containers that hold the water. What's the big deal? Well, it's actually the whole deal. See, these, uh, these jars, these six stone jars used for ceremonial washing, they were a part of the purification that the Jews would do so that they could be ritually clean. It was a part of the way that they got themselves to be in right relationship with God. And Jesus is going to take this old ceremony, this ritual, and he is going to give it new life. Because we read, verse 7, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw out, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. And he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after guests have had too much to drink. But you saved the best until now. And then we read in verse 11 how John summarizes this story. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. It was a sign pointing to his glory that caused his disciples to believe in him. After Jesus rose from the dead, when John was looking back at all that Jesus had done, he realized that Jesus was doing so much more than he saw in the moment. I mean, it's, it's likely that when that happened, everybody just thought, man, Jesus likes to party. This is great, right? I mean, yeah, 20 to 30 gallons of great wine. Sounds good, Jesus. Thank you. But that's not what Jesus was doing. That was a sign of pointing to a new reality. So we got to ask ourselves the question, what future reality does the sign point to? What's Jesus' point? Taking the six stone jars, the ceremonial religious washing and transforming that water into wine. What's Jesus getting at? Well, I'll tell you what he's getting at and then I'll tell you why we know what he's getting at. Here's what he's pointing to. Here's what the sign points to. That believing in Jesus 
not religious behavior is the new way to life. See, for two, three, four thousand years, I'm trying to remember how, no, maybe two thousand years, the Jewish people had had a religious way to behave in order to be right with God. Ceremonial washing, sacrifice, anything that you're doing to get yourself right with God, performing for God. That's the heart of religion. Religion is doing something, and because I did this, now God will love me more. And Jesus came to give us an entirely new way to relate with God. Instead of based on what we do, now it's based on our faith in him. And the reason we know this was the heart of the signs is that at the end of his gospel, after showing us all seven signs, after Jesus dies, after he rises again, in John chapter 20, John tells us what's behind all of the signs that Jesus had performed. John 20, 31. He says, but these signs, and it's clear from, from verse 30, these signs are written, why? That you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. All of the signs throughout the Gospel of John exist so that we may believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that by believing we may have life in his name. That we would no longer look to ceremonial washing, that we no longer look to religious ritual, we no longer look to performing our way into God's good graces. And instead, we would find life in Jesus' name. Now, the challenge for us is that we are not that much different than the people who lived in the first century. In that there is something in all of us that thinks we can perform enough to be right with God. Or, or, or maybe one way you could say it based on the text would be to ask you the question, what are your six stone water jars? What are your six stone water jars? These, these containers used for religious ceremonial washing. What is it in your life that when you do it, you think God loves you more and when you don't do it, you assume he's disappointed in you? Most of us have something like this in our lives. Now, we might be tempted, especially if you've been around church a little while, um, you might be tempted to think that this is mostly about how you come to faith in Jesus. And it is a part of that. It does matter. Um, if you're not yet a, a Christian, if you're not a follower of Jesus, what I do want for you is to be done trying to be good enough on your own and to embrace the fact that even though even though you have fallen short of God's standard, there is life to be found in Jesus. I want that for you. That's how we come to faith in Jesus. We believe Jesus and he gives us life. And that is how we live out our Christian lives. So I wanted to, uh, this, this struck me uh, on Monday morning. I wanted just to share something that happened to me on Monday morning. Um, I've I mentioned before that I'm, I'm doing this um, through the Bible in about two years plan. Um, and, and on Monday, uh, my assigned reading for that day had me in Genesis chapter 32. Now in Genesis 32, there's this random story of this man, Jacob, um, and he had a brother named Esau. And Jacob uh, basically tricked his brother Esau into giving up his birthright. And then they sort of went their separate ways. But Jacob knew that Esau was always really mad at him. And Jason, G Esau was like the stronger, more rugged brother. So sometime later, sometime later in their lives, Jacob and Esau are coming back into, into, um, to meet again. And Jacob is afraid that Esau is going to kill him and take all of his stuff. It's like, you know, like classic brothers. And, um, and in, in this story, you can read for yourself. I'm trying, trying to summarize it. In this story, uh, while Jacob is waiting to meet Esau, and he's horribly, horribly afraid, uh, Jacob begins to pray. And in, in Genesis 32, 10, um, I read a part of this prayer. I was just I'm reading through the chapter, but I got to verse 10, and I just wanted to read you what Jacob prayed and tell you how it struck me. Jacob's praying to God as he prepares to meet Esau, and he says this, I am unworthy 
of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. Now, as we, we've talked about before, um, the, the point of spending time in the scriptures, the point of spending time with God is not just to read it and be done, but it's to, to see what stands out to you, to see what God might want to say to you in it. And, and as I was just reading through chapter 32, I, I came to this verse and it just stopped me in my tracks. And I, I read it again. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. And what I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying to me was, Eric, you don't think you're unworthy, do you? You think you're doing pretty well. I was like, uh, yeah. Yeah, I do. I think I'm pretty, pretty all right most of the time. Pretty, pretty good most of the time. And the Spirit made it, made it so clear, made it so clear to me that until I saw myself as unworthy, as, until I saw myself as a person in need of grace, I was gonna be close, closed off from what God really wanted to do in me. The miracle of that verse is that Jacob prayed, I am unworthy of what? Your kindness and faithfulness that what God has for unworthy people is kindness and faithfulness. That it's the humility to recognize my right position before God, my position of great need, that opens me up to receive his kindness and his faithfulness. And as long as I walk around thinking that I'm actually doing pretty well, I've missed the whole point missed the whole point. That, that, that's why it's so important in this story, in this big story of creation, this redemption story, we have to find ourselves in the right places. Yes, you are created good. You are created in the image of God. You are an image bearer. You are designed good. That is true. And so am I. And it is also true that there is sin in my heart and that I am damaged by evil and I damage others with the evil that's in me. And as long as I think I only live here and I think I'm worthy and I don't make it to, oh yeah, I am unworthy, until I make it here, I'm never gonna appreciate Jesus and the cross. If I think, yeah, I'm basically good, I don't know what their problem is, this person is the one who's close to grace. And Jesus comes to us with these signs and in this first sign, and he says to you, and he says to me, let me invite you to be done with your self-righteous religion. And let me invite you to find life in my name. And then it's those who find life in his name that are sent together to heal as we await the time when he will set all things right. When, when Jesus performed this miracle at the wedding at Cana at Galilee, he didn't just turn water into wine. He pointed to the fact that he was going to create an entirely new way of relating to God based not on your self-righteous works, but on his grace. That by believing you may find life in his name. And so that's our hope over the next few weeks, that as we look at the signs of what Jesus was doing, we will find life as we put our faith in Jesus, the one who loved us and ultimately gave his life for us. Let me pray for us that God would do that in each of us. Heavenly Father, come to you in the name of Jesus and in Jesus' name, I pray that you would help each of us to confront the reality of our self-righteousness, the reality of the fear or the shame that keeps us bound because we think we need to be better, and that you would free us to find life by believing in you, Jesus. 
God, I pray that you would do this miracle in each of our hearts. And I pray that you would help us to look not to ourselves, but to you. That we would see the sign pointing to a new reality of life and grace and healing and wholeness and peace that can only be found in you. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.